Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. I really appreciate seeing so many faces in the audience. Um, I wanted to thank, uh, we've had a lot of thanks, but I wanted to thank the um, Brianne and Yvette for nominating me and all the students who are in the audience. Some of them are mine and some of them are not. And I just, I think it's great that so many people came out tonight. So thank you. Um, my name is Jess Thurkelson. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker and a, and a photographer. And um, I teach in the mass communication and journalism department. And I teach storytelling. I teach production, so multimedia storytelling. And as a documentary filmmaker, I think about uh, reconstructing reality, uh, reimagining reality, and fitting it into a story form. So uh, I think about story quite a bit. And I can see that it's really universal. It's ever-present. It's ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, story is uh, something that we can we can, we can see in so many different aspects of our lives. One of the things that I'm, that I'm really curious about, and I'm, I'm offering this question, is why do we connect so deeply with story? Um, why do we crave it? You know, why do we crave story in our own lives? And this is something that you know, I might go back to um, in the talk, but I just wanted to, to lay it out there. So why do we crave story? Why, why do we need it in our lives? But perhaps before we begin, I really should start with what is what do I mean by story? Because story can be used in so many different ways. Um, if you've been asked recently, how are you doing? How was your day? What have you been up to? I haven't seen you in a long time. What have you been up to? People are really asking you to tell them a story. Tell them a story about what have you been doing? What, what, what are you doing with your lives? So in a way, we're all kind of asking each other to be storytellers, are we not? In some sort of way, right? Um, in this regard, we're all connecting with each other's story in some sort of small way. And that can also kind of be the, the first definition of story, maybe the most basic definition of story that I'm going to offer you, and that is uh, a sequence of either a fictional or a real sequence of events, things that happen, right? This is, this happened, and then that happened. Well, I had breakfast, and then I biked over to school, and then I had a class this morning, and then I had lunch. <laughs> My day kind of goes around food, right? So, and then, like, you know, then I had something in the afternoon. So it's a sequence of events, right? Um, so taking that into mind, I want to, I want to do a little bit of a, an experiment. Um, I don't teach very large classes. Oftentimes, I, I have smaller classes. So it's interesting that you know, I've, I've been asked to give a lecture, because I don't lecture all that often. I, I, I have discussions. I have those small table discussions where we're able to have a little bit more of a conversation. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show an animation. OK, it's about 30 seconds long. There's no audio to this. So that way, you know, people don't freak out. They're like, there's no audio. There's no audio. OK, it's just animation. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you when this thing is done. And I want you to tell them, now you're getting nervous. You're like, I don't know this person next to me. I'm gonna, you're going to turn to the person next to you, right? And then I want you to, to tell them what happened. I want you to tell them the story of what's going on in this animation. OK? This is what you came to on Thursday night, aren't you happy? <laughs> OK, turn to the person next to you. For the next 30 seconds, tell them what happens. Take turns, 15 seconds each. You guys aren't talking. <laughs> Okay. 
All right, I'm going to bring us back. I'm going to bring us back here. OK. Now, at this point, if we were a small class, I'd be able to say, OK, so tell me what happened. But since we're such a large, maybe I'll guess maybe what you're saying. And you can give me a big nod. I can't really see many faces, but maybe you can give me a big nod or not. Did, did, we, did, we, um, did we have any characters in this? OK, so did we have, did, did, did you guys, you know, you see that there was a big triangle? There was a little triangle, there was a circle. Did you have any um, attributes to these characters? Were they like, one was angry, or one was like aggressive? Uh, maybe one was shy or bashful? Do you see one that was like maybe heroic, or you know, like had some courage? Maybe? All right, some of you are nodding, some of you are already asleep. So the, uh, the, 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 the thing here is, is that, okay, so you've, now you've made, you've given them attributes, you know, so you've given them some emotion. Um, was there a fight? Okay, there was a fight between the two. Um, so what happened here? Did you, did you basically give a sequence of events? Did you say a triangle and a circle come into the frame and they circle around the house three times and the big triangle hits them three times? Or did you say that there was a struggle and a fight and the large triangle gets angry at the end. Basically said that, right? So was that, was that? I'm just going to assume that you did, right? So just to move on. Okay, so let's assume that you did. Um, so what happened there? That wasn't, that wasn't the complete and true sequence of events, right? So we, there, there's something going on there. Um, you, you, you imposed your own emotion into very abstract shapes and forms that were just kind of moving around the screen, right? Maybe. This was, this was an animation that was done in 1944 by two psychologists um, from Smith College. And uh, what they were interested in was that how we impose emotion onto events. So maybe what we need to think about is, is that um, there's more to possibly a story than simply a sequence of events. You know, you imposed your own. You are a participant in this story. Is that true? You're a participant. It's not so much this is coming at you. This happened, and then you were a part of it, right? So maybe we need to change, change the definition then of a story to include that. And maybe saying a sequence of real or fictional events in which the audience imposes emotion onto the actions or onto the characters themselves. Now, this is, this is fascinating. I find this fascinating. I think this is fascinating, right? Because, you know, have you, heard, have you heard the term the magic of storytelling? The magic of storytelling? You've probably heard that. I mean, is, isn't that like the, isn't that Disney's brand? Like, the magic of storytelling? Um, the magic of storytelling comes from this. It comes from the fact that it's not one direction. You are bringing your own background into it. You're bringing your own emotion into it. So there's something going on here. So I'm going to ask you another question. I'm just going to keep throwing questions at you. So, here's, so you remember the first two questions that I asked? Why do we crave story? Yeah, why do we crave story? Good. Nikki goes on to this. So why do we crave story? Um, so here's another question for you. How is this done? How are some stories, how do, they, how do they elicit emotion from you while other stories don't? Or maybe there's a different degree. Some stories elicit more emotion from you than others. There's some sort of, is there some sort of magic in this? I think that's a fascinating question. And so did this guy. This is Aristotle. Aristotle, more than 2,000 year ago, years ago, thought about this. He's like, well, our story's magic. And if you've ever studied anything that Aristotle did, he, is, he, he, he takes a categorical approach to everything. So he wrote this big treatise called um, Poetics. And he basically took all of the Greek canon of literature, and he broke it apart. And he's like, I'm going to find out what this story, what story is. Um, and Aristotle came up with this, uh, this thing that said, yeah, there's six components. There's basically six components, I find, right? He's saying there's plot, character, thought, diction, melody, and spectacle. And he said, this is the, this is the most important parts of what create a story. Now, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things wrong by you know, coming up with a very categorical approach to something so magical as a story. And there's some things that are wrong with this, but I kind of wanted to bring up um, one of his most important parts, and he said the most important thing about a story, and, and that's plot. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to throw another question at you. <laughs> and I want you to think, do you know the difference between plot and story? 
Do you think you know the difference between plot and story? Now, this is, this is something that you, know, you might say, um, well, gee, they're, they're kind of similar. They're really, they're really similar. Um, but a lot of times when I ask students this, uh, they have difficulty um, being able to put it into words. And this is how I kind of think of it. If you think of plot as things that happen to the character, okay, these are incidents that happen to the character. And your story is how your character reacts. Does that make sense? So it's like, Plot is basically things that happen, OK? And they can be outside the character, they can be inside the character, but they happen to the character. And your story is how your character reacts. What is that dependent upon? That depends upon the character itself, right? So if you think about simple plots, complex characters, this is something that almost all creative writers or storytellers think about. They think about simple plots, complex characters, because there's an infinite number of stories but is there an infinite number of plots? OK, so um, there is this guy uh, who came up with this book. His name's Christopher Booker. He came up with a book. His name's Christopher Booker. Um, and he said, there are seven basic plots. OK? There are seven basic plots. And I just, I just love when people come up with lists. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, the first one, he says, is overcoming the monster. And he actually takes a lot of this from Aristotle and a lot of other um, writers who are um, narratologists. So overcoming the monster. The hero learns of a great evil threatening the land and sets out to destroy it. OK, so what I want you to do now is I want you to think about a movie that you've seen in the last year that follows this plot. On the count of three, I want you to just yell it out. Ready? Got it? One, two, three. So there's a lot of movies out there, huh? There's a lot of movies out there that follow this plot, do you think? I mean, this is kind of a, a very popular plot. Hero learns of a great evil threatening the land and sets out to destroy it. A rags to riches. Surrounded by dark forces who impress and ridicule him, the hero slowly blossoms into a mature figure who ultimately gets riches, kingdom, or a partner. Rags to riches. Another plot structure. Quest. Hero learns of some magical objects that he desperately wants or needs to find and sets out to find them, often with companions. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. There's a lot of them, right? Voyage and return. Hero heads off into a magic land with crazy rules, ultimately triumphs over the madness and returns home far more mature than when he had left. Now, not all stories follow these plots but they might have elements of each. They might have a variety of each. A comedy. Hero and heroine are destined to get together, but a dark force is preventing them from doing so. But in the end, they triumph and love wins out. Sounds familiar? Tragedy is the flip side of overcoming the monster plot. Our protagonist character is the villain, but we get to watch him slowly spiral down into darkness before he's finally defeated, freeing the land from his evil influence. Anyone watch Breaking Bad? <laughs> and finally, Rebirth, which is very similar to the tragedy, except the, protagon except the protagonist, who is the villain, finds out the error of his ways and changes his, his tune before the end of the, end of the film. And he, and he uh, does a heel turn to avoid his inevitable fall, like despicable me. <laughs> <laughs> so seven basic plots, right? OK. Um, so what, um, what can we get from this? What can we get from this? Um, I'm talking about structure here. So I'm, I'm kind of digging deep into story, because I want you guys to understand a little, a little bit about the structure before we do that. And I thought it'd be fun uh, to give you a, um, I thought it'd be fun to give you a little bit of a, 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 a case study. Okay? And I thought I'd do that with some Pixar films, because why the heck not? Okay. So let's, let's think about story. And has anyone heard of the three-act structure? You're like, oh, God, I heard the three-act structure. Three-act structure. I'm going to give it to you very, um, from a bird's eye view. And then I'm going to break it down into how we set up our story. Three-act structure very simply is the first act, you set up your characters, and you set up their task. Second is you set them off on some sort of journey, some sort of venture, where they, they have quests 
come up with uh, hardships, um, and then they come up to some sort of climax. And the third act is some sort of resolution in which the character finds an equilibrium that's different from the first act. Okay? That's basically it. First act, it's, and you have this resolution going on. So um, most stories fail as a story in the first act because the storyteller fails to catch you, fails to hook you. And they do this because they don't set up their story right. So I'm going to use some examples from Pixar to show you how Pixar sets up their story and how they hook you, how they get you to get emotional into their story, right? OK. So the first thing they do is they have to set up their character. And you set up your character by doing this. The first time you see the character, you got to see the character doing something that they love. What is their greatest passion? What, do, what defines them as a character? Okay. So in the case of Toy Story, we see Woody, right? And the first time Woody comes up on the screen, he's playing with Andy. Has everyone seen this movie? This is like, like everyone's seen this movie, okay? So this is his greatest passion, right? His greatest passion is to be playing with Andy. This is what defines him as a character, okay? And that's the first time we see him. With Finding Nemo, the first time we see him is when he's moving into a new house. And he's also expecting all of these kids. So he's a family man. We're setting him up as a family man who really loves to, uh, loves to be the, the, the father figure. And with The Incredibles, we see Mr. Incredible, the first time we see him, fighting crime. What does he love? What's his greatest passion? Fighting crime. We know that. We're defining. Next thing we have to do is we have to give the character a flaw. But there's, there's, a, there's a hook. The character's flaw has to come from the character's greatest passion. Okay? It has to come from something that you just understand them to love so much. Right? So in the case of Toy Story, the, um, Woody's greatest, pa greatest passion is playing with Andy, but he's a little bit jealous. And he doesn't want to share this with anyone. So he's got this sense of pride. Right? With Finding Nemo, um, Marlin has this kind of insensitivity. Okay? What if they don't like me? Marlin. What if they don't like oh, me? Really? Right? Um, and with The Incredibles, we also have a sense of pride. Uh, Mr. Incredible doesn't want to share the spotlight with anyone. And we see this the first time that he meets Buddy. Tool ready for takeoff! What the? Who are you supposed to be? I am your number one fan! Okay? Um, we also we see it when he's. share, you know. I work alone. So we also see it when he's on the roof with Elastigirl. So we have this character's. Um, greatest uh, passion, and we've also set up this flaw about their character, but their flaw comes from their passion. Okay, so now we're 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 starting. We're developing the characters. The next thing that we have to do is we need to establish that there's trouble on the horizon. We see the characters doing what they love the most, right, and everything is wonderful for them. And now we have to show that there's something on the horizon that might be problematic. Okay, and I, I'm just calling this approaching storm clouds, right? So do you, do you already know what's going on with the approaching storm clouds for Toy Story? The approaching storm clouds is the fact that Andy's birthday party has been moved up. Okay, uh, oh yes, one uh, minor note here. Andy's birthday party has been moved to today. Okay, so the birthday party has been moved up, and now all the toys are freaking out, and they're thinking, well, we're going to be replaced. So now there's this, there's this approaching storm cloud. And with Nemo, there's been this uh, setup between what's outside the coral and what's inside the coral. Inside the coral is safe. Outside the coral is uh, kind of scary. And with the Incredibles, at Mr. Incredibles' wedding, he hears his wife uh, whisper, I love you, but if we're going to make this work, you've got to be more than Mr. Incredible. You know that, don't you? So long as you both shall live. So we hear her say, um, once you're married, things are going to change, right? So things, so we've, there's, there's an approaching storm cloud here. And then later, with Mr. Incredible, uh, he's, he meets Buddy again. And uh, we, there's, there's something else that's established with more storm clouds here. This is because I don't have powers, isn't it? Well, not every superhero has powers, you know. You can be super without them. Okay, so this kind of sets up the fact that there is a... Um, there's an anger between supers and people who don't have superpower. So now we set up 
this outside storm cloud that's coming in, right? Okay, so we set up the character, we show them what they love doing, we give them a flaw, we've, we've had approaching storm clouds, what do we do next? We have to have something called an inciting incident. And basically this is like lightning striking, okay? Lightning strikes and the world just turns upside down. We're setting up the story here, right? We're setting up the story. So the world just turns upside down. Ah! Whoa! Hey, whoa, 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 did I frighten you? Okay, so with Toy Story, it's Buzz shows up. Buzz shows up and kind of turns Woody's world upside down. And with Nemo, uh, it's the Barracuda that comes. Hopefully I'm ruining this movie for everyone. The Barracuda comes, okay? Uh, I don't know if this is... The Barracuda comes, kills his wife, and kills the, all of his family except for Nemo, okay? That is the ba-boom of that film. And then for The Incredibles, Mr. Incredible is sued. That is, the, that is the lightning strike here. Mr. Incredible is sued, and all supers are um, banned to uh, not show their superpower, okay? So it was, this decada, it was this hatred between supers, and now they can no longer um, actually have their powers in, in, in public. Now, if that's not all, we have to do one more thing. We have to now show that the world is not fair. We have to add insult to injury, okay? Now we need to basically show that um, not only did your world turn upside down, but it's, there's, something, there's something wrong. Something is wrong with the world. And uh, add insult to injury. So with Toy Story, Buzz shows up. And the insult to injury is Buzz is kind of like a buffoon of a toy. Right? He doesn't know that he's a toy. He says, you know, I can fly. Uh, I've got these great wings. And Woody says, no, you can't fly. They're just made of plastic. So, they, so then Buzz gets up on the, the banister, and he basically jumps off, right? Do you remember this scene? And he's like, you know, bouncing and going all across. And all the toys are watching him. All the toys are watching him. And uh, they're all amazingly impressed by basically a lot of luck. But they believe that he's flying. And um, the important thing here is that they're all impressed. All of these toys are impressed with Buzz, but yet it kind of adds as insult to injury because now Woody, who's been displaced, now has this like, well, that was really unfair. He's just a toy. But now everyone thinks he's got something more than that, something greater. With Nemo, we don't really need to kind of add insult to injury because that was kind of a big blow. I mean, his, his entire family and 399 kids just kind of died, so that's enough insult to injury. This is a kid's movie, OK? Um, <laughs> And with The Incredibles, the insult to injury here is um, the fact that Mr. Incredible was sued, but yet he was trying to save that guy's I life. Hey, I saved your life! You didn't save my life, you ruined my death! That's what you're Listen, my client has no free to comment at this time. So he was actually trying to do the right thing there. He was trying to, he was trying to save it. So you kind of have this insert, you know, this, this world is, is unfair. We got it? Okay, so we've done a lot of things just to set up this story. This is all to get you emotional, right? This is all to get you emotional. So we see the character's greatest passion. We see their flaw coming from their passion. We've, then what? We've had approaching storm clouds. Something is off in the distance. And then the inciting incident. Something happens, but boom lightning strikes. And now we add insult to injury. What happens now? The world just turns upside down. They need to do something. They come to a fork in the road, OK? They come to a fork in the road. And now the main character has a choice. They can take the responsible way. They can take the responsible way, and uh, the very, um, the very Buddhist approach, and say, uh, "Buzz, it's great having you here. I accept you as the new leader. Congratulations." Very boring story, huh? Very boring story. Um, so they have this. They can go to this. They can go the high road, or they can go to this low road. And we all are kind of like rooting for them to do the low road. If they do the high road, no story. If they do the low road, there's a story, OK? So um, with the case of the Toy Story, um, uh, Woody kind of realizes, ah, I can push Buzz behind this uh, dresser. OK, this is, this is a pretty, you know, this is a bad move on, 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 on Woody's part, right? But we're almost like, we're hoping that he does, because we know how much he loved playing with Andy. We know his greatest desires. And he has this big plan, and he tries to push him back, but it doesn't work. And now these series of unfortunate events happen, and Buzz gets pushed out the window. Okay? He gets knocked out the window. 
And when this happens, all the toys see what happens, and they come rushing over, and they're like, holy cow, would he just pushed Buzz out the window, even though it was a series of unfortunate events. And then they say, you need to go and get him. You need to go and get him. That is the act break. Boom. And we are off into our second act, because Woody has a clear goal now. And we just set up our story. We know what his motivations are, and we know um, what he needs to do. So that's going to take us through Act 2. We set up Toy Story really smart in order to do that. Right? You're emotional. You're emotional now. OK? With Nemo, um, we understand how, uh, how much Marlin, what Marlin lost. We understand what he lost. A wife and 399 kids. It sucks. So um, we're rooting for him. We, you know, we, we feel bad for the guy. And what is his flaw? He's a little bit insecure, which kind of turns into this overprotectedness. Okay? So he has this overprotectedness. And um, he sees Nemo playing by the, the end of the ocean here. And he gets him. He goes, you can't do that. You have to come back. And that kind of angers Nemo. And um, you know, it was the decision. And then Nemo goes and swims out to the boat, which turns into him getting caught by the diver. Um, and it was because of the flaw of Marlin's flaw being too overprotective. Uh, Nemo gets caught, and then Marlin swims after him, and that is your, set break, your act break there. Marlin has a clear goal for act two. He needs to get Nemo. He needs to swim out and find him, right? We understand what his greatest passion was, was his family. He lost most of his family. We understand his flaw, but we're willing to forgive him because we understand what he's going through. And now we're moving into act two, which is to understand which, which is going to bring us into all these trials and tribulations of him trying to find Nemo, right? So we are, we're setting up the story now, and we are emotional about what's going to happen with Nemo and Marlin. That's why we care. That's why we care. And lastly, with The Incredibles, um, we see Mr. Incredible at the office, okay? And he is miserable, right? Because he gave up his superpowers, he's not doing it. His wife, um, so we don't blame him. We don't blame him when... His wife says, you got to save the world one permit at a time. And he's just like, I can't do that. So he's actually moonlighting with Frozo, his uh, pal, to go fight crime like on the sly. Right? It's the wrong choice to do, but we kind of like that he's doing it because we know how much he loves it. Right? So he's, he's, he's really enjoying this, but it's the wrong thing to do. Um, but this kind of sets off the fact that other people start seeing that he's doing it. And now he gets, uh, this is Mirage, and then Mirage finds him that he's, he's doing this on the sly, and she gets in touch this with him. This is Mr. Incredible. I'm in. And asks for him to fight crime on the sly uh, with her team. And we know how much he loved fighting crime. We know how much he lost it. And now this sets him off to the second act, where he's going to be working together with them. So our story basically comes from our character's greatest love, greatest passion. You have a flaw. The flaw comes from their passion. We have approaching storm clouds. Something happens. The world is turned upside down. They no longer, they no longer can live in the world that they love. And they have a fork in the road. And even though they choose the low road, we're still rooting for them. We still want them to do that low road. And there is no story unless they choose that. That, that lower path. And this is, you know, we, we always, uh, I have conversations with friends and they were like, you know, stories are, you know, how come there's, there's no one normal in a story? <laughs> you know, like there's, no, there's never any normal characters. It's because if your characters don't make, you know, rational decisions, there's no story. But yet we want them to make these decisions both based on emotion because that's the part that we're giving to the story is our emotion, right? So um, I'm going to throw another question at you. Uh, do you remember all the other questions that I asked? <laughs> Uh, so this question is, um, do we see story in other parts of our lives? So I, I, I do documentary filmmaking. I reconstruct reality to make a story, so I see it everywhere. But maybe you do, too. There's been narrative. Could there be narrative in other parts of our lives? Um, I think there is. I think there's story everywhere. Um, for those of you who are science, science, uh, anyone who does science in here, um, if you if you, uh, so I used, to, I used to study geology. I used to be a geologist. And the thing about geology is that you're basically trying to form a story. You see rocks, and you're like, well, what happened here? Like, how did this rock get on top of this rock? 
Why are these rocks folded? Where did this mountain come from? Has this ocean always been here? How did the story of this happen? Right? So geology is kind of like you get the events, and then you have to reconstruct them to make sense. You're creating a story from the sequence of events of what happened. Do we see it in professional sports? Oh, yes. We sure do. Um, for those of you who watched the Super Bowl this year, you might have noticed that the pregame was 22 minutes long. And you're probably like, holy cow, you're going to talk to me for 22 minutes? What are you doing for those 22 minutes? I'll tell you what they're doing for those 22 minutes. They're giving you act one. They're setting up their characters. They're giving you what their greatest joys and their flaws are so that you are more invested into act two, which is the game. And then post-game, act three, the resolution. Have you ever heard announcers in sports say, it comes down to this? You ever hear that? Sometimes I hear that. Um, it comes down to this. What are, they, what are they talking about? It comes down to this. Maybe they're saying, you know, this moment is going to define this game, and this game is going to uh, define this season, and this season is going to define this career. You know, so they're creating this drama. They're giving you a story. It's what we love. How about Olympics? We definitely see, we see it in Olympics. We've all uh, done some sledding since uh, we, were, we were kids down the snow. And luge is basically an extreme form of sledging in which you go really, really fast on, uh, on hard ice. This is basically the video you see before the luge competition. We are introduced to this character, and we see him practicing. We understand what neighborhood he comes from. We understand how many hours a day he works. We are invested in him by the time we see him go down a luge chute. So we get act one before we get act two, which is the actual performance of the luge. Do we see it in history? Sure. History is but a sequence of events, is it not? In a way. Is story involved in history? Definitely. Definitely, right? Um, there are, uh, history is just, is just a bunch of stories. This is a picture uh, believed to be of Christopher Columbus. Um, how has Christopher Columbus's story changed throughout the years? It has, right? Sure. Think about, think about um, what's going on right now. Okay? What is going to be, from 50 years from now, what is the Iraqi war going to be remembered as? What is the story of the Iraqi war? Is it going to be one story? Is it going to be in the many stories? Which story is going to win out? How about the war on terror? How is that story going to be played? How is that going to be won? You know, it's, it's a narrative that we're all part of and we're all participants in. How do you be a part of that? How about religion? Religious monomyths. In a lot of the religious monomyths, there is this separation, initiation, and return. You see this hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are encountered there, and a decisive epiphany is felt. The hero comes back to this mysterious adventure with the powers to bestow onto his fellow man. Okay, so we have Jesus. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and came back and shared what he learned. We have Moses goes up to the mountains, talks with God, and comes back with um, Ten Commandments. We have uh, Buddha, Siddhartha, who leaves his father's palace, um, lives as a monk for seven years, and then finds enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and then comes back and shares what he learns with his fellow men. And we have Prometheus from the Greek myth, who travels up to heaven, steals fire from the gods, and comes back to earth and shares it. It's that idea of separation, initiation, return. You see the three acts? You see the structure? It's there too. How about politics? This is fun. Decision after decision in Iraq, John McCain was simply wrong. Uh, and Barack Obama demonstrated the kind of judgment that's necessary to lead this country. What John McCain spent the last 90 minutes doing was advocating more of the same. And if people think the country's uh, headed in the right direction over the last eight years has either brought economic prosperity or greater security, uh, then I think John McCain's their guy. Uh, I think he looked erratic. I think he looked rattled. He, quite frankly, looked perturbed. Uh, I think that was because uh, he knew, like the American people did, that Barack Obama commanded the state. I think, uh, you know, tonight is going to be the difference between uh, Barack Obama's campaign claiming victory and John McCain winning victory. This was an extraordinary night. Barack Obama was on defense the entire night, whether it was spending, whether it was taxes, whether it was the surge. Uh, John McCain has a record. So it, it fits him. These debate formats really work well for the senator because he has a record that he can call back to. Okay. These, these, these spin rooms, right? 
spin rooms. I, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, with politics, it's almost like this retroactive narration. Do you see that? Things happen, and then when they, after they happen, someone tells you what happened. Okay? There's this, there's this um, reconstruction, reconstruction of a story. Uh, this is the presidential debate of 08, and it's the same thing in all of them. You know, afterwards, you get this reconstruction of reality, of actually what happened, and what do you remember? It's easier to remember the story than it is actual to remember this. It's easier to remember the story. I'm going to go back to that. That's actually a phenomenon I want to talk about. Judge Judy. Okay, did you know that this is one of the most popular um, daytime television shows? Isn't that awesome? USA. So the reason why is because, I don't know, if, you've ever, if, you, if, if you're like me and you just sit at home and watch Judge Judy all day, then you'll realize the structure of a Judge Judy is basically this. She has the plaintiff come on, she has the defendant come in. She goes, tell me your story. And then she you know, interrupts them. Tell me your story. And then she interrupts them. Tell me the story again. Okay, tell me your story. It's basically just telling me the story, and then she constructs the story, right? It's just a lot of different kinds of narrations that are going on, and then she constructs what comes out to be, you know, the ultimate Judge Judy truth. How about, um, how about in advertising, branding? Does anyone remember this commercial? This is like a Super Bowl. I have, I have Super Bowl references. This is a Super Bowl commercial from a few years ago. And the, and the story here is, you know, you put your, you put your, your, your coin in the um, Coke machine and there's this magical mystery place where, you know, this Coke is, is made. But the whole point is, is that Coke is selling happiness, right? So, you know, this, this entire story is to make you, oh, isn't that cute? That's great. This is what happens in a Coke machine. Um, but it's a story. What other stories do you believe from branding, from products? Probably many. There's amazing amounts of stories that we believe from products and branding. This is a program at Columbia University called Narrative Medicine. Okay? And this is, this is actually this is, this is a newer field of medicine, but the whole mission of this is to give doctors the narrative competence to be moved by the story of illness. If you go to the doctor, the first thing they ask you is, what happened? What's wrong? And you basically give some sort of, well, you know, I was playing in the driveway and I jumped and landed on my foot and it twisted. So you give them a story, right? So this is, this is a um, medical program that is there to help doctors understand narration and how illness can be helped by understanding narration. Last thing I want to talk about, the story of you. Um, do you have a narrative in your life? When is your act break? Is it now? Is it maybe after the semester? Maybe is it once you graduate? Maybe it's once you get that job? Or, um, you know, once you get married, have kids? That's actually the end of the story, right? No. <laughs> so, when is your act break? Is it, are you, are you expecting something? Are you the hero of your story? Are you the supporting character? Are you waiting to be rescued? Um, we kind of think about this. Are we waiting for, as Aristotle put it, all the loose ends to neatly tie together? Does that ever happen in life? And does that make us depressed? Because we're waiting for that. We're waiting for that moment of release when everything is just right at the end of a story, as it can be. But yet in life, it never really works out that way. I think one of the things, the interesting thing here is that um, after nourishment and love, the, the need to tell and hear stories is almost essential to, our, to, our, to who we are as humans. It's essential to who we are. We, um, we learn we understand in narrative form. We learn and we understand in narrative form. We, we recall knowledge in stories. The same way in that politics, do we, do we remember the talk, do we remember what is actually debated or do we remember the story? We remember the story. The entirety, the entirety of human knowledge is based on story. How long did we have oral history? A very long time. The entirety of what we know is based on story. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? When you think about it, when you really think about it, we create a concept of ourselves in the same narrative form. So the question that I asked was, the first question that I asked, I asked many questions. The first question I asked was, why do we connect so deeply with story? Why do we crave it in our lives, right? Um, I'd like to offer, I'd like to offer uh, my thoughts on this. My thoughts on this are this. Um, 
We build knowledge in narrative form. We recall knowledge in narrative form. The only way that we share life's experiences is through story. We share this experience of life with others through story. So does it not make sense that in order to feel this experience of being alive as deeply as we possibly could, why wouldn't we connect the story? So in conclusion, I wish you all a very wonderful uh, continuation of your own story. Thank you.